Good morning. I'm Pastor Ed Thomas, and we welcome you to Spirit of Joy in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Each week this summer, we invite your family to explore the attributes of God by way of our letters of the week. Today's letter is S. What can your family come up with as an attribute of God that starts with S? Then midweek is T for trustworthy. We hope your family has a blessed week. grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Worthy is Christ, the Lamb who was slain, whose blood set us free to be people of God, power and riches and wisdom and strength, and honor and blessing and glory are His. This is the feast of victory for our God.
If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Most merciful God, we confess that that we are in bondage to sin and cannot cannot free free ourselves. ourselves. We We have have sinned sinned against against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son to die for us. And Christ so loved the world that he gave his very life upon the cross. Hear the good news. Dear friends in Christ, our loving Lord washes away your brokenness and forgives you all your sins. Come wash me in mercy. Come bathe me in grace. Clothe me in a righteous and loving embrace. Salvation has a smile on his face as he washes in mercy and bathes me in grace. Let us pray. Please bow your heart with me. Great God, As we gather again in spirit through the marvels of technology, we pray for our community of spirit of joy and for our local, state, and national communities. Lord, we pray for our world. Bring peace, bring healing. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For those in our families and church family who are sick and hurting, and for those who are dealing with this disease and its aftermath, including the thousands upon thousands who are grieving. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. We thank you, Lord, for medical professionals and those working in clinics and nursing homes, for the diligence of scientists aiming towards treatments and cures, for the storekeepers and farmers and truck drivers, for police officers, firefighters, and EMTs. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For those impacted economically in this time of shutdowns, Lord, bring world economies back. For those dealing with anxiety, fear, and depression, still their hearts and let them know your presence. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For churches across this world, Lord, that they may proclaim hope in this season of uncertainty. And for all church leaders, including those at Spirit of Joy, Keep them strong so that they may keep us strong. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Dear family in Christ, we invite you to continue praying at home. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. Lord, listen to your children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Lord, listen to your children praying. Lord, send your spirit in this place. children praying. Send us love, send us power, send us grace. Our first lesson is from the 17th chapter 
of 2 Kings. The people of Israel secretly did things that were not right against the Lord their God. They built for themselves high places, places where they worshipped pagan gods in all their towns, from watchtower to fortified city. They set up for themselves pillars and sacred poles to these false gods on every high hill and under every green tree. There they made offerings on all the high places, as did the nations whom the Lord carried away before them. They did wicked things, provoking the Lord to anger. They served idols, of which the Lord had said to them, You shall not do this. Yet the Lord warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer, saying, Turn from your evil ways. But they sold themselves to do evil in the sight of the Lord, provoking him to anger. Therefore the Lord was very angry with Israel and removed them out of his sight. None was left but the tribe of Judah alone. But Judah also did not keep the commandments of the Lord their God, but walked in the customs that the northern kingdom of Israel had introduced. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second lesson is from the 10th chapter of Romans. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart who will ascend to heaven. That is to bring Christ down. Or who will descend to the abyss. That is to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart. That is the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Four. One believes with the heart, and so is justified. And one confesses with the mouth, and so is saved. The scripture says, No one who believes in him will be put to shame, for there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all, and is generous to all who call to him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, will be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all have obeyed the good news. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So, faith comes from what is heard. And what is heard comes from the word of Christ. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Holy Gospel, Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land, for... The wind was against them, and early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost, and they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, 
It is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. He said, come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came to Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened and began to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, Oh, you of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased, and those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. As we begin our sermon for today, I want to highlight one phrase that we just read in 2 Kings 17. It says, in spite of all of this rebellion, that's the context, making of the, the worship places for Baal, the high places, setting up what they called sacred poles, it says, yet the Lord, warned Israel and Judah by every prophet and every seer, saying to them, turn from your evil ways. I want to tell you one of my favorite stories in Scripture today. It is from 1 Kings chapter 18. It is when... Isaiah battled against the priests of Baal. Do you remember this story? King after king of Israel was evil. Only evil continually. That's a line actually from Genesis chapter 6 right before the flood. But every king of Israel fit that pattern. Only evil continually. And then Ahab stepped it up a notch when he married the foreign queen Jezebel. Jezebel brought into the city of Israel, which was Shechem in the north, brought in, lined the streets of this city with, you know, imagine that there is your normal thoroughfare through a busy city street. She allowed the priests of Baal to build little booths all the way on both sides of that. And so Baal, who is either Satan or the chief of demons, Baal was becoming more and more their object of worship. And so Elijah comes to them and Elijah says to the priests of Baal, I challenge you, essentially, this is my translation, to a duel. Here's what we will do. We will invite the entire city out to join us, and we will make two great altars of wood. And I'll let you guys go first. We will see who can light these altars on fire by just calling on our gods. And so the priests of Baal marched around all morning long and <laughs> nothing. <laughs> and so it says they were actually cutting themselves. I mean, just that evil of shedding blood. And so they were cutting themselves. They were crying loud. <laughs> Isaiah, Elijah started taunting them a little bit. Uh, can't your gods hear you? And finally, after nothing, for hour upon hour upon hour, Elijah said, all right, now it is the turn of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he said, wait a minute, before we do that, at the bottom of this mountain, there's a little stream. Send everybody here with any kind of bucket, any kind of water container down there to scoop out as much water as they can, and let's douse this altar with water. 
Make it soggy, make it wet, make it hard to start a fire. And everybody's kind of laughing at him, and, but Elijah uses them to soak the altar. And then he goes, all right, do you want to see who the true God is? And he just looks up to the sky and whoop. <laughs> Wasn't that perfect? This weird flashing light thing that we have. Whoop. I think it may be tied to my voice. <laughs> but there was fire on the mountain. And the people killed the priests of Baal. And Jezebel got very upset. Elijah went running. But here we go in terms of this miraculous story that the prophets came to warn the people of Israel. I want you to think today about the role of a prophet. I want to read you several stories to give you just a little bit of a glimpse of what a prophet would have gone through. Uh, think of Elijah. Uh, the, I tell you what, it is the least pleasant job in the history of creation, being a prophet for God. You had to poke the king often in the nose. In this case, <laughs> he poked the queen, Jezebel, in the nose. She sent an army after Elijah. Being a prophet is a thankless job. So let me tell you the story of Hosea. This is Hosea chapter 1. The word of the Lord came to Hosea in the days of King Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah. When the Lord first spoke through Hosea, the Lord said to Hosea, Go take for yourself a wife who is a prostitute. God, really? Go take a wife who is a prostitute? I mean, all of the women in the kingdom, and you want me to go marry a prostitute? Yes, and have children, here's the next thing God says, of whoredom. Have children with this whore? Actual words of the Bible. Uh, God says yes, because... The land has created great whoredom by forsaking me. So Hosea went out and married Gomer, the prostitute. She conceived and began to bear him children. And essentially, if you read this book, remember his thankless task? Here's what would happen. Hosea gave his heart. He was an honorable man. He brought Gomer into his home. They had children together, and for a while it was good. But every once in a while, Gomer would go back to her old ways. And so she would disappear, and she would be prostituting herself out. Maybe adultery, sometimes prostitution. And, but, Gomer would, or, but Hosea would go out, and he'd take Gomer. And he'd bring her home. And he'd wash her clean of her sins. He would restore her in his household. And things would be good for a while again. But then there she'd go. And he'd go and he'd bring her back. And there she'd go. And they lived in a small town. Hosea was just an ordinary man. And about the point where everyone in town was laughing at Hosea, can't even control your own wife, was mocking him, said, she's just a prostitute, she's just a whore. Then it was that God said to Hosea, now tell them. And he said, friends, this is a parable of you and your God. God is the faithful husband. You are his prostitute bride, adultering yourself, chasing after other gods. It was a horrible job to be a prophet. <laughs> we turn to the book of Jonah. 
Jonah was given the job of going to the most blasphemous people that he could go to, proclaiming a message of repent and God will save. And Jonah wanted nothing of it, so Jonah, you remember the story, ran the other way. (laughs) Jonah ran. Uh, God says, you can't run from me. Caused a storm at sea. They tossed Jonah overboard because he said, it's my fault that the storm is here. He was swallowed by a great fish. Anybody here looking for a job as a prophet? Remember Isaiah? For three years, in like chapter 20 of Isaiah, uh, Isaiah had to strip and go naked in order to proclaim the message. It wasn't seeking through And so here he was going naked just to try and gain their attention. God told him, do this. (laughs) So, who are the prophets? I told you a moment ago that Hosea was just an ordinary man. That's often who God would choose. (laughs) Remember the story of, of... of Jeremiah, the words of Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah. This is one, now verse 4. Now the word of the Lord came to me, Jeremiah, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you a prophet to the nations. Then I said, Ah, Lord God, truly I do not know how to speak, for I am only a boy. Here he was. Who does God use? He uses ordinary people like Hosea. He uses little boys. God said to him, don't say I'm only a boy, for you shall go to all to whom I send you, and you shall speak whatever I command you. That's where the power is. It's not in the person, it's in the word that God gives to proclaim. So Hosea, ordinary man. Jeremiah, ordinary and just a boy. Moses, we don't think of Moses as a prophet, but he was. He was raised in a palace. Daniel, prophet, rose to prominence within the Babylonian palace. Elijah, he was chased until he was ready to die. Ordinary people, some given authority in their kingdom, some chased until they want to die. But prophets of the Lord, the power is not in the person. The power is in the word of the Lord. So what what is the role of a prophet? I want to turn here very quickly to Isaiah 7 and 8. In Isaiah 7 and 8, there are uh, three children. And Isaiah used the names of these three children to tell a powerful story. First, actually third in order, (laughs) first in the way I'm going to tell it, was, uh, and this is in 8 verse 1, May her shall al hash baz. (laughs) How <laughs> would you like a name like that? May her shall al hash baz. <laughs> uh, worst is what it meant. Now, every name has a meaning. My name means kingly. My person could have just, my parents could have just named me kingly. And everybody, when they heard my name, because it was uncommon, would say, that's a weird name, kingly. <laughs> is that what you really are? Imagine giving any sentence or word to someone because it's a nonsense name. It's not a name. It's a nonsense word or phrase. And that's what may her shall al hashbaz was. Do you know what it meant? It meant the spoil speeds and prey hastens. All right, translate that into what we would say is things are getting rotten and the enemy's coming. Imagine. Isaiah going everywhere and pointing out this kid. Says, hey people, 
here's what you need to know. This is my son, and the meaning of his name is the message you need to hear. Things are rotten, and the enemy is coming. Essentially then, shape up, or this will happen. Right? Okay? But there were two other children in the midst of this. Secondly, there was Shir Joshim, which meant a remnant shall return. There's this child. A remnant shall return. Things are rotten. The enemy's coming. But even if the enemy comes, even if the enemy takes you, a remnant shall return. Four, third child, name is Emmanuel. Heard that one before? It means God is with us. Things are rotten. The enemy's coming. But in the end, a an, uh, remnant shall return because... God is with us. Now, what does a prophet do? Can I tell you something? It's thrilling. When we think of prophecies, usually we think of those that were largely fulfilled in the days of Jesus. All right? That's what we think of. We hear that name, Emmanuel, and we read the verse and it says, again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, one of the kings, saying, ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. It's the second person in all of history that I know of that God said, treat me like a, a genie in a lamp. Ask anything you want to. Ahaz was proud. He thought he was being religious. He said, oh, I will not ask. I will not put the Lord to the test. And Isaiah said, come on, he just told you to. Isaiah said, hear then, O house of David, is it too little for you to weary mortals that you weary my God out also? Therefore, since you're not going to ask, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel. Isn't it thrilling when we can point forward to all that God is going to do. Uh, Emmanuel is who? It is Jesus. This prophecy 500 years before prophesying the coming of Jesus. Do you remember what happened in Isaiah 53? Uh, it is that powerful prophecy that says he was despised and rejected by others. A man of suffering and acquainted with infirmity. Uh, he was despised and we held him of no account. Think of the cross. Hundreds of years before the cross was ever invented, Isaiah is proclaiming what Jesus will do. Surely he has borne our infirmities and he has carried our diseases. He was wounded for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the punishment that made us whole, and by his bruises we have been healed. With amazing specificity, hundreds of years before the cross, don't we thrill when we look at those prophecies that point us forward? It is magnificent. But you know what a lot of prophecy was? A lot of prophecy was designed for the people of the prophet's own day. Things are rotten. And if you don't shape up and return to the Lord your God, the enemy is coming. But even if we are conquered, and a remnant shall return because God is with us. That is the role of a prophet. It is to speak to God Sometimes the prophet speaks thousands of years in advance. Do you know Daniel, for example, in the midst of their exile, proclaimed to the day, Palm Sunday, <laughs> hundreds of years in advance, to the day. I preached on that before. Isn't that cool when that happens? Isn't it cool when... Daniel prophesies what will come at the end of time. Something that is affirmed by Jesus. He says halfway through the time of tribulation. 
seven years, three and a half, middle point, there will be an abomination that causes desolation set up in the temple of God. Imagine all that is going on right here and right now. Imagine. But primarily, the prophets were speaking to the people of their time. Sometimes it works on the two levels. Emmanuel was a word for Ahaz, and it was a word for the future. But in the midst of our story, we are focusing on the role of the prophets for right now. And so I want to tell you just a story or two. I want to use primarily Ezekiel because Ezekiel has some of the most poignant of stories that encapsulate this in a way that's easy to understand. Now, the major prophets were Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel. And essentially their books are split into kind of two parts, two primary parts. Some say three, but I'm going to focus on the two. And that is before they went into exile, it was a message of warning and coming judgment. Okay? Things are getting rotten. And so it's a warning. If you don't repent, the enemy is coming. That's the first half. The second half was after the enemy had come. It was after they had been carried into exile. And now it was a message of hope. So the first half is warning. The ending portion is hope. So let's start with the warning. We're going to start in Ezekiel chapter 16. It says, The word of the Lord came to me, Ezekiel. He said, Mortal, make known to Jerusalem her abominations and say, Thus says the Lord to Jerusalem, Your origin and your birth, we're in the land of the Canaanites. Your father was an Ammonite. Your mother was a Hittite. Remember the story of Abraham? He came from another land far away. And it says, and as for your birth, on the day you were born, listen to this, your navel cord was not cut, nor were you washed with water to cleanse you, nor were you rubbed with salt, nor were you wrapped in clothes. You were nothing. You were forgotten. You were laying out there naked and alone. No eye pitied you to do any of these things for you out of compassion for you, but you were thrown out into the open field for you were abhorred on the day you were born. How nothing could you get? Israel, you were nothing, but I passed you by. I, the Lord, passed you by, and I saw you flailing about in your blood as you lay in your blood. I said to you, live. You're living only because God has breathed into you that breath of life. And it says, you grew up like a plant in the field. You grew up and became tall, and you arrived at full womanhood. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown, yet you were still naked and bare. So I passed by you again, and I looked on you, and you were at the age for love. And I spread the edge of my cloak over you. Remember that from a few weeks ago, the story of Ruth, where Boaz spread his cloak over her? She was now under his protection, his umbrella. But, but it was more than that. It says, I covered your nakedness, and I pledged myself to you and entered a covenant with you. This is a marriage proposal, both by Boaz and by God, the king, to the people of Israel who started as absolutely nothing. He says, then I bathed you with water and washed the blood from you. I anointed you with oil. That's a royal image. 
I clothed you with embroidered cloth and with sandals of fine leather. I bound you in fine linen and covered you with rich fabric. I adorned you with ornaments. I put bracelets on your arm, a chain on your neck, a ring in your nose, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown upon your head. God, the king of creation, is making Israel his people his queen. It is a marriage image. It is a covenant. God, who is king, is pledging his love to these people. Not because they deserved it. Not because they were worthy. But because God is worthy. And God is love. I made you my people. I put a crown on your head. He says, but... You trusted in your beauty, and you played the whore because of your fame. You lavished your whorings on any passerby. You followed any other nation. You followed any other God. You played the whore. You prostituted yourselves with them. You took some of your garments and made for yourselves colorful shrines on those high places. And on them you played the whore. Nothing like this has ever been nor ever shall be. You also took your beautiful jewels of my gold and my silver that I had given for you and made yourself male images and you played the whore with them. <laughs> How sick is your heart, continues the chapter. How sick is your heart. Therefore, O whore, verse 35 of chapter 16, Therefore, O whore, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God, Because your lust was poured out and your nakedness uncovered in your whoring with your foreign pagan lovers and because of all your abominations, abominable idols, and because of the blood of your children that you gave them. Gave the blood of your children. Therefore, I will gather all your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those you loved and all those you hated. I will gather them against you. They shall bring a mob against you. They shall cut you to pieces with their swords. They shall burn your houses and execute judgments on you in the sight of others. I will stop you. From playing the whore. So here's the image. You hear the warning, right? The image is things are getting rotten and the enemy is coming. God is saying, turn from your ways or destruction is near. Do we take that seriously? Our sin? Things are rotting. How many of you can look at the world and say, Things are rotting. And then how many of you look at yourself and we wind up excusing our little bit of compromises, our little bit of sin. It's not that bad. One of the best books I've ever read is Neil Plantinga's book called Not the Way It's Supposed to Be. He subtitles it A Breviary, A Theological Exploration of Sin. He says, in this book, I am trying to retrieve an old awareness that has slipped and changed in recent decades. The awareness of sin used to be our shadow. Christians hated sin, feared it, fled from it, grieved over it. Some of our grandparents agonized over their sins. A man who lost his temper, we say that that's big, might wonder if he could still go to Holy Communion. A woman for, who for years envied her more attractive and intelligent sister might worry that this sin threatened her very salvation. But the shadow of sin has dimmed. Nowadays, the accusation, you have sinned, <laughs> is often said with a grin and with a tone that signals an inside joke. At one time, however, the accusation still had the power to jolt. 
As a child, he says, growing up in the mid-50s among Western Michigan Calvinists, I think I heard as many sermons about sin as I did about grace. The assumption in those days seemed to be that you couldn't understand one without completely grasping both. Many Christians still recall sermons in which preachers got angry, visibly angry over a congregation's sin, making red-faced and finger-pointing. You were, you were never in doubt what these preachers were talking about. But the newer language of Zion fudges. <laughs> I'd just like to share this morning that we need to target holiness as a growth area. We fudge. So he says, why retrieve the awareness of sin? He says, the reason is that Christian truth saws against the grain of much in contemporary culture and therefore needs constant sharpening. Christian truth, God's ideals, righteousness, holiness, cuts a grain of, against the grain of what this society says. We are not just tempted by so many things in this world. We constantly give in to them. One of the lines that's haunted me over the years is that parents, whatever you tolerate, your children will celebrate. That's what happens in the next generation. The things that were barely tolerated a generation ago are now celebrated today as normal. Sexual revolution. We're at the point now, and people have been warning us, where the next frontier that will be called normal, and who are we to say who we should love is pedophilia. It's going to be the children next. How dare we speak out about something that's just love? What we tolerate, the next generation will embrace. I like this line here. In one of the best known and most widely reproduced editorials on morality in the 90s, the Wall Street Journal recounted a number of public sex scandals and said, the United States has a drug problem and a high school sex problem and a welfare problem and an AIDS problem and a rape problem. None of this will go away until more people in positions of responsibility are willing to come forward and explain in frankly moral terms that some of the things people do nowadays are wrong. It's a hard job being a prophet to poke not just the king in the nose, but to poke your friends and the neighbors in the nose. To say to them, there is a standard. And what we are doing, slowly, methodically, even in the lives of us individual Christians, is pulling out from under us the foundation upon which we stand. We're not standing on much anymore. When you hear those words of the prophet, that name of Meher Halas Shashbahas, that means things are rotting and the enemy's coming. Do you hear the warning in that? Things are rotting and if we don't change, there's the warning. The enemy will come. What we've once called good and safe will fall apart. We're at a place where in American society, it's getting closer to 50%. Believe there's going to be a next civil war and a division in our nation. Things are rotting. An enemy is coming, seeking to tear not just our nation, but our world apart. Do you see that? Is there hope in the midst of this? There's always hope. Remember, a remnant shall return. Why? Because God is with us. Let me close today with that word of hope. Still again from the book of Ezekiel. 
This time we turn to chapter 7. And Ezekiel says, The hand of the Lord came upon me. And he brought me out by the Spirit and set me down in the middle of the valley. It was full of bones. He led me all around them. There were very many lying in the valley. And these bones were very dry. He said to me, mortal, can these bones live? I answered, oh Lord, only you know the answer to this question. Then he said to me, prophet, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will lay sinews on you and I will cause flesh to come upon you. I will cover you with skin and I will put breath in you and you shall live. And you shall know that I am the Lord. So says Ezekiel, so I prophesied. As I had been commanded and as I prophesied, suddenly there was a noise, a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to its bone. I looked and there were sinews on them and flesh had come upon them and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to the breath. Prophet, prophesy to the breath. Prophesy mortal and say to the breath, Thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe upon these slain that they may live. And I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them and they lived, and they stood on their feet, a vast multitude. And then he said to me, mortal, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up. And our hope is lost. We are cut off completely. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back to Jerusalem, to the land of Israel. Now, I want you to hear this story as Ezekiel's near-term prophecy. Remember where he was? He said, things are rotting, the enemy's coming. Well, the enemy came, Babylon came, wiped out Israel, left a handful of people there, but mostly tore down the walls. Most of them they carried back into exile in Babylon as slaves. And yet, a remnant shall return. God will breathe his life back into these dry bones and they will live. Why? Because God is with us. Where's our hope in this world right now? God hasn't made those promises to America. We're on our own in terms of that. But he has made the longer term prophecy that the graves will be open. Some would say, no, that was just speaking figuratively. No, this is the longer term prophecy. That God will bring us back to the new Jerusalem. He has a plan for us. He will breathe and we who are dead and dry shall live again. Why? Because of Emmanuel. God is with us. A remnant, not everyone, but a remnant shall live again out of the midst of the destruction. Dear friends in Christ, let us not just be the remnant that will live one day. Let us be prophetic, even if it means occasionally sticking our fingers in the noses, and hopefully you're a little more graceful than that, but being forthright and speaking about morality, of speaking about sin, of speaking about truth gracefully. But maybe we can be the prophets who breathe life back into the bones in our current broken world.
God said, prophesy to the breath. Well, the breath in the Hebrew words is the Holy Spirit. Let us speak to the Holy Spirit boldly. Let us be the remnant who brings life back to our land. Amen. Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give him thanks and praise. It is indeed right and life giving that we should, at all times and in all places, offer thanks and praise to you, O Lord, Holy Father, through Christ our Lord, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, Lord God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the how on the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, and after he blessed it, he broke it and said, take and eat, this is my body, broken for you. Each time you eat this bread, remember me. Again after supper, he took the cup and said, this is the new covenant in my blood shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you drink from this cup, remember me. Our Father, Father who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. You may now enjoy communion at home. Bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.